The American Philatelic Society is the nation's oldest and largest organization of stamp collectors. Among the many services provided to members are a monthly 100-page stamp journal, the American Philatelist, use of the largest public access philatelic library in the country, a sales division where members may buy and sell stamps among themselves with APS serving as agent, low-cost stamp insurance, expertizing services, and a variety of educational offerings. For details, visit www.stamps.org. Please note, no portion of this program may be reproduced without the written permission of the Education Department, American Philatelic Society. The APS is pleased to make the audio-visual program library available to its many members, chapters, and affiliates. The library consists of over a hundred titles, ranging from general interest or introductory to more specialized programs, including both U.S. and foreign. A listing is available on the APS website. The election of Warren G. Harding to the presidency in 1920 ushered in a new era in the design and production of United States postage stamps. This program will introduce some of the men behind the stamps issued during the eight years of the Harding and Coolidge administrations. During the 1920s, the U.S. Post Office Department was housed in this building on Pennsylvania Avenue in Washington, D.C. Here worked the Postmaster's General, who had final authority for the nation's stamps and their subordinates. We will meet some of these post office men in this program. During the 1920s, the Bureau of Engraving and Printing, hereafter referred to as the BEP, a division of the Treasury Department, produced all of our country's stamps in the facility shown on the lower left of this postcard, located across the tidal basin from where the Jefferson Memorial now stands. Here worked the director of the BEP, the designers and other skilled craftsmen, all of them men, and the unskilled workers, all of them women, who actually produced the stamps. We will meet some of these men in our program. The BEP was located only a short walk from the Post Office Department. President Harding's first Postmaster General was his campaign manager, Will Hayes of Indiana. He served only one year in office. No new stamps were issued during his tenure, although the old Washington Franklins continued to be printed. Hayes was succeeded by Dr. Hubert Work of Colorado, a physician by trade. Like Hayes, he served only one year in office. However, it was an eventful year which witnessed the issuance of the first stamps which would come to be known as the series of 1922, or the Fourth Bureau issue. This picture is autographed by work to Robert S. Rieger, his always honest, industrious, and loyal clerk. We will learn more of Rieger, a career service employee of the Post Office Department, in a moment. One of the responsibilities of a Postmaster General was to approve the design of a new stamp before it went into production. The signature of Postmaster General Work on this large die proof of the two-cent Washington, the most common stamp in use in the 1920s, indicates his approval. A die proof is printed directly from the die produced by an engraver. It became something of a custom in the 1920s for the first few sheets of a newly printed stamp to be signed by the Postmaster General and other dignitaries of the Post Office Department and the Bureau of Engraving and Printing. This pane is from the first sheet of the two-cent Washington to be printed. In addition to the signature of Postmaster General work, it contains the signature of W. Irving Glover, the third assistant Postmaster General, the official in charge of the stamp program. It was also signed by Lewis Hill, the director of the BEP.
The least common stamp in the series of 1922 and the high value of the series is the $5 America. Here is a large die proof of that stamp, Works signature indicating his approval. Although the design of the $5 America stamp was approved by Postmaster General Work, Harry New was in office as Postmaster General by the time the stamp was issued. His signature appears on this block. Harry New of Indiana, a former senator, became Postmaster General two years into the Harding administration. After the death of President Harding, the new president, Calvin Coolidge, retained New as Postmaster General, who then served until the end of the Coolidge administration. The Postmaster General had underlings who had responsibility for the stamp program. The most significant of these was W. Irving Glover of New Jersey. As third assistant Postmaster General from 1921 until 1923, he had responsibility for the stamp program and first conceived the idea for the series of 1922. In this picture, Glover on the left and New on the right are shown examining some of the Harding Memorial stamps. In this picture, New and Glover are joined by one of their subordinates, the superintendent of the Division of Stamps, Michael Eidsness. The Harding Memorial stamps shown being examined by Eidsness, New, and Glover in the previous pictures were necessitated by the sudden death of President Harding on August 2, 1923. Work on a memorial stamp proceeded so quickly that Postmaster General New was able to approve its design on August 21st, as indicated by his signature on this large die proof. The initials on the proof belong to Michael Eidsness, Superintendent of the Division of Stamps, and W. Irving Glover. These three men were the driving force behind U.S. stamps in these years. Postmaster General New and Lewis Hill, Director of the BEP, signed this plate block of the Harding Memorial Stamp. Third Assistant Postmaster General W. Irving Glover was a friend of stamp collectors. He not only established the philatelic sales agency to cater to their needs, he also made an effort to give timely notification of new issues to the collecting public, something only infrequently done prior to his time. Shown here is an announcement by Glover of the six cent definitive stamp in the series of 1922. This announcement is typical of those used during these years. Glover's interest in stamps was shared by his wife, who collected first-day covers, a specialty that became popular in the 1920s. This cover is addressed to Mrs. Glover at their residence at the fashionable Wardman Park Hotel in Northwest Washington. Here is a stamp announcement from Glover's successor as third postmaster general, Robert S. Rieger. Sometimes, when the postmaster general was unavailable, stamps were approved by another official. Glover approved the design for the six-cent Garfield in his capacity as acting postmaster general. In the case of the one-cent Washington, John H. Bartlett, the first assistant postmaster general and a former governor of New Hampshire, served as acting postmaster general to approve the stamp. Of course, women were also involved in the stamps of the time, even if they did not figure as prominently as the men. One of them was Alice Memenhoff of Indianapolis, private secretary to New, who also hailed from Indianapolis. This is a letter from Memenhoff to a collector and mutual friend back in Indianapolis, Frank Demerley. She enclosed three recently issued airmail stamps initialed by New, 
and made a comment which probably raised no eyebrows at the time, but which might trigger an ethics investigation today, and which might be seen as a foreshadowing of the Farley scandal in the next decade. She wrote, even if tongue-in-cheek, that she would expect a rake-off in years to come when these stamps were worth about a million dollars. Notice the black-bordered morning stationery. Written on August 21, 1923, the nation was still mourning the recent death of Warren Harding. These are the three airmail stamps, initialed by New, that his secretary sent to Mr. Demerley. They are great collectibles, but worth far from the predicted million dollars. Not all of the men who signed at newly issued Paines were employees of the federal government. This five-cent Huguenot Walloon piece, issued May 1, 1924, was signed not only by the usual suspects, New, Glover, Eidsness, but also by the Reverend John Bear Stout, a Reformed Church minister who was director of the National Huguenot Walloon New Netherland Commission. The second assistant postmaster general, Paul Henderson, got into the autographing act by signing this airmail plate block issued in 1923. As second assistant postmaster general, Henderson was the official in charge of transporting the mail, and he devoted much energy into developing the transcontinental airmail route for which these airmail stamps were intended. He held the office of second assistant until he left the department on July 1, 1925, to go to work for a fledgling private air carrier. Federal workers going into the employ of private companies they once regulated is nothing new. Postmaster General New authorized the first souvenir sheet issued in U.S. history. Issued to honor the International Philatelic Exhibition in New York City in 1926, it used the design of the White Plains Commemorative, the large die proof of which is shown here. A detail from a souvenir sheet shows the signatures of New and Robert S. Rieger. Remember him? He was Postmaster General Works always honest, industrious, and loyal clerk, who was promoted to third assistant postmaster general in 1925 when Glover was promoted to second assistant, the official in charge of postal transportation. Until this point in our program, we have focused our attention primarily on the men who worked for the post office department. We now turn our attention to those who actually produced the stamps at the BEP. This pane of the so-called White Plains Souvenir Sheet was autographed by the stamp's designer, the legendary Claire Aubrey Houston. It was also signed by John Eisler, who engraved the stamp. During his 30-year career at the BEP, Eisler engraved the dies for 75 stamps. The pane is also signed by Andrew Black, the sonographer who made the printing plate. Claire Aubrey Houston of Philadelphia designed literally every new stamp issued during the period covered by this program. The amazing career of this prodigious BEP designer began in 1902 and lasted for 31 years. Houston, whose signature appears here on the 1927 Vermont issue, was described by the director of the BEP on the occasion of his retirement this way. He had no superior. Indeed, his work was altogether unique. There is no other individual like him in government service. Andrew Black was the sonographer at the BEP whose signature appears on the previously shown White Plains sheet. A sonographer is a person who makes a printing plate from a transfer roll, which had in turn been made from the engraved die. 
This picture shows Andrew Black in the process of creating a plate on the transfer press. Sodographers engraved their initials on a finished plate. During the time covered by this presentation, they appeared on the lower left corner of the printed sheet. Here, Andrew Black's initials appear on the 1928 Valley Forge commemorative. The plates for this two-cent North American stamp were a collaborative effort between sodographers Andrew Black, who laid out the black vignette plate, and Clyde V. DeBender, who laid out the plate for the red frame as their initials in their respective colors indicate. Clyde V. DeBender was one of the more prolific sodographers at the BEP. He laid down both the vignette and frame plates for this five cent North American. His signature is shown. Here are Clyde de Bender's sodographer initials on the five cent aeronautics issue of 1928. He signed the block, as did the engraver of the die, Lois S. Schofield, who engraved about a hundred stamps in his almost 40-year career at the BEP. More about engravers in a moment. Clyde de Binder was not the only member of the family employed at the BEP. His father, Samuel de Binder, laid out the plate for this 25-cent Niagara stamp, which he signed in the margin. Samuel de Binder, shown here, was employed as a sodographer at the BEP from 1908 through 1929. Samuel and his son Clyde began employment at the BEP on the same day. Clyde de Binder was a stamp collector. This first day cover, signed by the designer of the Arbor Day stamp, is addressed to de Binder at his home in Washington, D.C. Clyde de Binder created plates for the Erickson stamp and the Lindbergh stamp, among others. Of course, there were still other sodographers at the BEP, like Albert E. Fisher, who laid out the plate for this special delivery stamp, and Daniel M. Clancy, who laid out the plate from which this nine-cent Jefferson was printed and William McAleer, who created the plate from which this stamp was printed, and James C. Philgate, and Clarence I. Ronceville, and John H. Silbert, Jr., and Daniel W. McCallum, to name but a few. In 1928, a decision was made to stop engraving sodographer initials on plates this piece, with the initials of our friend Albert Black, came from the last plate to bear sodographer initials. On the opposite side of the plate, found on the lower right corner of the printed sheet, are the initials of plate finishers. A plate finisher's job was to remove any extraneous marks from a plate after the sodographer had completed his work. A plate finisher then entered his initials with a punch, which is why they generally have a less pleasing and less uniform appearance than the engraved initials of a sodographer. The plate finisher initials on this piece belong to James M. Butler. Sometimes more than one plate finisher worked on a plate. This block shows the initials of John J. MacDonald and James W. Gesford. Joseph P. Lennon and Walter Edward Spring. William W. Malone and Charles H. Roll. And Albert W. Leaguer, among others.
We have so far discussed three types of skilled craftsmen at the BEP. The designer, whose artistic talents began the process of creating a new stamp, and the sodographers and finishers who created a plate. In between these men were the engravers, who took the design and engraved it into a die from which a sodographer made a printing plate. This block of the one cent Lexington Concord of 1925 contains the signature of the legendary designer Claire Aubrey Houston and the signatures of its three engravers. Engravers tended to specialize in certain kinds of engraving. In this example, Joachim Benzing engraved the frame, Fred Pauling and Louis Schofeld worked together on the picture, also known as the vignette, while Edward Weeks engraved the lettering. The die for the sesquicentennial issue was engraved by two men. John Eisler did the vignette and Edward Hall did the lettering. Note again Houston's signature as designer. All of these men, designers, engravers, sonographers, and plate finishers, were accountable to the director of the BEP. Lewis A. Hill, whose signature is found on this piece with the signatures of post office officials, became director in March 1922 when his predecessor lost his job due to a scandal. When that predecessor was subsequently cleared of wrongdoing in the scandal, Hill graciously resigned so that the predecessor, James Wilmoth, could return to his former position. But Wilmoth declined to return to the BEP. Hill left anyway. So Hill's replacement at the BEP in late 1924 was Alvin Hall, whose signature appears on this 1928 aeronautics stamp margin. Hall served as director of the BEP until 1954 and is probably best remembered for the fact that his children appear on the Arbor Day stamp of 1932. They signed this card some years after the fact. In concluding this tribute to the men who produced the wonderful and exciting stamps of the 1920s, we would be remiss to not acknowledge the man to whom all of them were accountable. This 1927 letter from President Coolidge to the Postmaster General acknowledges the President's receipt of the Postmaster General's annual report. Today's collectors owe a debt of gratitude to all of these men for the unsurpassed stamps of the 1920s. We hope you have enjoyed this APS program prepared by Rodney Jewell and the Education Department. The APS welcomes your comments on this presentation and your ideas on topics for future slide programs. If you know of an outstanding collection, suitable topic, or existing program of another society that would make an interesting program, please contact us. Do so also if you would like more information about other available programs. Contact us at www.stamps.org.